Welcome to the, to, to the new panel. Uh, we'll now hear oral evidence from Rick Parry, Parry uh, Chair of the English Football League, Richard Masters, Chief Exec of the Premier League, and Mark Ives, General Manager of the National League. And for this session, we have until 11. Um, so I call the first member who wishes to ask questions, Steph Peacock. Uh, good morning and thanks for, for joining us all. Um, the reason we're here is that self-regulation of football hasn't worked, particularly in relation to financial sustainability, and obviously the government have therefore introduced this bill, one which we support. And one of the key parts of that is the owners and directors tests. So do you think the current owners and directors tests are fit for purpose? Does the bill improve them? And will you continue with your own directors and owners tests once the regulator is conducting theirs? And that's to each member of the panel. Who wants to start? Do you want me to go first? So we obviously support very strong ownership tests. We believe we have one at the moment. Um, I think the bill, in terms of the way it describes the owners' tests, there's a lot of questions that still need to be asked. We may, in our written submission to this committee. Um, and first of all, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak to everyone today and to put our perspectives across. Um, so we very much support a strong ownership test. A question about whether it's been successful... I believe it's been more successful over time. Obviously, the ownership <coughs> test is relatively new in terms of football. Football's been around for, for centuries. The ownership test is a relatively recent intervention. And football has responded to issues, regulatory issues, as all regulators do. So football is already a highly regulated industry. We, the Premier League, are already regulated by the FA, by UEFA and FIFA. Uh, we are a regulator ourselves. So the bill um, and the new independent regulator for football is going to be an additional regulatory layer. Uh, we have, uh, uh, and all of all our discussions uh, with DCMS, we've been quite clear that we would like to continue with our own test. And obviously the closeness of those two tests is quite important, and the consistency of results that come out of them is quite important as well. Um, when you read the bill, one of the, one of the things that you probably notice in comparison with the Premier League's current mm -hmm. test, which is very similar to that of the EFL, is it's probably going to capture a broader group of people, and it is more subjective one of the things that we've been quite careful about over the years is to make sure the test is as objective as possible because that creates more certainty and less legal challenge. And so we'd like the committee to think about that uh, as, they, as they observe the bill. They give as much clarity as possible to competition <coughs> organisers on the issue of ownership as possible. Um, I think where the regulator can help is in bringing greater transparency Football doesn't do transparency very well. It likes to live in the dark. Um, greater consistency across leagues. Um, and statutory powers, I think, will be extremely helpful in terms of capturing information. Um, the threat of criminal sanctions for failing to comply is pretty potent, pretty powerful, something we can't compete with. Um, we will certainly not be having a parallel test. We don't want duplication. We, we're very happy to throw our support behind the regulator and recognise that a better test is something that we'll be very happy with. Okay, can I uh, also add, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing us to be here today. Uh, I appreciate that. From an owners and directors test point of view, we are, from the National League, in a slightly different position <coughs> than our colleagues in the Premier League and EFL in that the National League are governed by the FA regulation for the owners and directors test. And uh, I've spoken before about the powers that this bill will bring with the ODT, and I welcome that. Uh, I think it will give us greater ability, will give you greater ability to be able to get access to information that we don't have. And the current test, uh, although it's being reviewed from the FA's position, is primarily a self-assessment. Um, and, of course, uh, that comes with many, many problems. So... I, I welcome the owners and directors test. The one thing I would urge um, government to look at is that to ensure that speed of operation is really good um, because the time it takes to get somebody approved is really important for takeovers and everything else. Uh, and the other challenge with the ODT is not only when owners come into the club, uh, it is at what stage during their lifetime within a club does their suitability change? And so we need greater detail as to how that will look at. So when does a good owner at the start of their tenure suddenly turn out to be a bad owner halfway through that tenure? And, of course, it will be difficult once somebody's in 
to make a substantial change. Not impossible, but it will be difficult. And how we manage that. And from a National League perspective, we, we haven't got a queue of people waiting to take over clubs. So we need to think about the consequences of the test on existing owners. Uh, and again, I would share the views that the league's um, action to sense check that as we move forward and make sure that clubs are compliant is really important. Communications from the Premier League have stopped short of outright rejecting the bill, but have warned against unintended consequences. Could you outline what these unintended consequences might be? I will do my best. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to do so. I think, in general, obviously we're supportive of the objectives of the bill. Um, we want to see those objectives work. We're obviously concerned that what is, uh, to, to all intents and purposes, a very successful and tree isn't harmed. And it's very important the Premier League, at the top of it, not just for the, for the sake of the Premier League, is able to continue with its success and growth, because that success and growth helps fund the rest of the pyramid. Uh, and we're happy to share our success, and we have a strong track record of, of doing so. So I think that where, uh, what we would like um, um, this, uh, this committee to look at are the unintended consequences of, of um, regulatory interventions that are unnecessary. So proportionate, represent, proportionate regulatory interventions dealing with the issues that are arising. So to use a sort of motoring metaphor, we agree that if you're speeding, that there should be regulatory tools to intervene. We wouldn't want to see the speed limit reduced from 70 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour to keep everybody safe. We think that would be a step too far. Our core concerns also are always about, as Marcus alluded to, is increasing the pool of investment that comes into football. Yeah. The Premier League has been successful because it's been able to create an atmosphere where people want to invest in buy football clubs and put their money behind the aspiration of coming up the pyramid. And we see examples of that all the time. We think that's really important. Uh, so we need a, throng, uh, a strong and vibrant pyramid. So to us, it's about long-term certainty and about proportionate intervention. And if those things aren't, uh, aren't correct, then we might see some of the unintended consequences that I've explained. The rules not specifically address the way money is invested into clubs, and what is different, therefore, about the regulator monitoring this? As a number of financial regulatory tools, at the moment you'll all be aware of our, uh, our PSR regulations, they're really about competitive balance, but also have, a, have an aspect of sustainability to them, essentially a limited loss situation. Where clubs uh, are, are loss-making, they have to provide two years of financial information to the league, and if they're loss-making beyond a certain threshold, they have to stand behind the business plan of that club um, and provide secure and funding commitment to the league. So the league does have sustainability rules in place, as does the EFL, as does the National League, and perhaps it'd be good for the committee to hear about how all, that, how all that works. There are measures in place, but they will be different, and what we're seeing here in the bill is prudential regulation, which is born out of the financial services industry, and obviously there is, aren't many parallels between banking and football, Obviously, we're worried that prudential regulation could be too interventionist and could uh, tie up investment or deter investment to the detriment of the whole football pyramid. All three of the minutes from Commission. Will it be short? Minister. So the, the regulator will have a duty to work with the leagues when they're exercising their regulatory functions um, and have regard to those existing rules within your leagues. How do you see that working in practice and how are you sort of reforming your own structures to ensure that regulation does work effectively? And also, Richard, if I can just push you on, you know, you, you talked around the unintended consequences. Can you give the committee a specific example of what that might be? Oh, well, um, so it is unclear... A lot of this depends not upon the technical drafting of the bill, but upon the personality of the regulator that we're yet to meet. So another point that's been made really does depend upon how the regulator and its powers are going to be utilised. If, for example, the regulator wishes to put um, financial controls on virtually all of the 116 clubs in which it wants to licence, I believe that will stop investment into football squads and into football in general, and will slow down the growth of English football. So that is the principal um, unintended consequence that I've been concerned about. Can I add to that, if I may? Um, from an unintended consequence, there's a couple of things <coughs> for us, um, and particularly when you consider the size of the National League clubs and, and how they are, how they're staffed. 
Uh, and at, at the moment, the way the bill is written, uh, it gives the what it's going to attend. It doesn't give the how it's going to uh, achieve those aims. And there's massive uncertainty as far as the clubs are concerned. And one of the unintended consequences, as we see it, is the drain on the resource of those clubs for the duplication of work and the over-bureaucracy that there may be. So, for example, um, we already have a licensing system. And our licensing system includes our football, regula uh, football finance regulations, which have been um, uh, activated since 2013. And it should be worth noting that whilst we're talking about improving the sustainability of our clubs, the National League, and I can only talk about the National League, the National Division, has not had a club go into administration since 2013, since it brought in its financial regulations. So that's not a bad record. Um, and our concern is the duplication of that um, licensing scheme. We would urge, uh, and as Minister rightly says, that there's a referral back to the league regulations. We had hoped that there, that would go further and put the onus on the league, on the competition, to be the first to react. And if that doesn't work, then the regulator steps in. Rather than creating a lot of duplication of work, as we see it, for our clubs. The other issue is costs. The, the, the bill is intended to ensure financial sustainability. Yet the concern of this, and like all regulators, the, the people who pick up that bill are those that are being regulated. I'm not sure the clubs fully understand that. And from a, when you're at the bottom level of, of what's being regulated, the fear is the, the, the quantum of those, those costs. And um, if you have a challenge that goes to judicial review from one of the National League clubs, I suspect the financial cost on that is not going to be too great. However, if you have one of the top clubs in the Premier League who challenge the regulator, I would imagine that the costs on that are going to be really significant. And those costs get passed on to those being regulated. And they could run into millions of pounds when the costs of those are being borne by clubs at the National League level. So in our view, the, the bill is not strong enough in clarifying what proportionality means. We've given assurances on meetings. We've had some very good meetings with, with DCMS um, with the Minister and Secretary of State where assurances are that it will be proportionate but we don't understand what proportionate is so one of the unintended consequences is the financial burden and human resource burden on our clubs I think it's incumbent on us to work with the regulator to make sure that this works for the good of the game so we see big pluses in terms of the regulator bringing independence transparency consistency across leagues which is a bit of a disaster area at the moment um, so we we uh, we view it positively everything we've found so far in terms of engagement with DCMS and, and in terms of the shadow body that is the regulator is that all of these concerns can be addressed it's going to be a tougher environment football needs a tougher environment we've had 30 years to get this right and we failed just to ask you a question Stuart about um, what plans the bodies are making to adjust to the regulatory world. I mean, I think we'll all, we will all have to adjust to the new environment that's coming. Uh, I'm very happy to do so. Like Rick, we are already meeting with the shadow regulatory team on a regular basis, have a very good conversation about how it might work in practice. So in reality, the, the performance of the regulator, I think, can be managed, and we will meet that obligation head-on and ensure that they get all the information they need and we respond at all times. But I think that the, the, the issue that we are most concerned about, as I said, is, the, is, is what impact that might have in the wider system beyond the very positive uh, objectives of the regulatory to give fans a stronger voice, to uh, improve the sustainability of the pyramid and individual clubs, to avoid <coughs> some of the issues we've had in the past. We agree with all of that, um, but make sure that it doesn't impact on the very good success story that we have at the moment. Can I echo that as well? Because... Um just to clarify some points that where we stand as far as the regulator is concerned. Uh, from, from day one and, and from when Tracy started the fan-led review, we met with the fan-led review and we were asked our, our position as to whether or not we wanted to be part of the regulator. Um, we said, yes, we did, um, uh, on, the, on the understanding that it wouldn't be too onerous for our clubs and would keep a mind on the costs. That's what was said. 
Um, so we're mindful of that. We embraced the regulator. Our position was always, if there's a regulator, we thought it should be the FAA, but for reasons well documented, we know why it can't. Um, so we move on and we embrace the regulator as it is. Our challenges are not about having a regulator. They're about understanding and having clarity on how the regulator will work. So we actually embrace it, we will work with, we've had some very productive meetings with DCMS uh, and discussions all the way through. They've been very productive. All we're trying to do is to make sure that it's not too onerous for our clubs and not too costly for our clubs, um, because we have to protect the interest of those clubs and they need clarity. Okay, Damien. Thank you. Um, Richard Masters, uh, earlier on you, at the beginning, you raised some concerns about the checks on new owners, and you said that you wanted a process where it was governed by objectivity and certainty, I think were the words you used. I think a lot of people would look at the live example at the moment of Everton and 777 parts and say that does not look like a situation which is being governed by objectivity and certainty, and is the kind of case where the regulator may well have taken a different view than the Premier League and may well have re rejected the, the takeover. And I'd be interested to know given your concerns about the regulator in this regard, given after eight months, 777 still haven't met the criteria that the Premier League has set, why hasn't the Premier League rejected it? Well, um, to be clear about what the Premier League's role in this is, as, as regulator, is to perform the test. It's not to decide who uh, the current owner wants to sell this club to. That is his decision. And the moment he wants to continue to have discussions with 777 about it, the Premier League has made very clear the conditions that have to be met by 777, if it wishes to become the owner of Everton. And at the moment, obviously, because the, the takeover hasn't been confirmed, I'll leave it to the committee to, to make its own conclusions about where we are with that. Well, Rick and Mark have talked about, actually, some of the benefits of the regulatory ownership test in the sense they'll get access to more information that we can have because we're, we're not a statutory body. So we can only get the information we're provided with and we have strong investigatory powers. So um, the other thing that Mark talked about was about speed. And I do accept that... Uh, takeovers that carry on for a very long time are not good for fan certainty and that's why we have a very big team of people that do nothing else than this. All I would say is that over time, particularly in the Premier League, takeovers are becoming increasingly complex <coughs> um, and this is not a small undertaking on behalf of the regulator to take this particular burden on. That's why we want to remain involved with it as well. It's very complicated and we need to make sure that all those decisions are correct, even if that means taking a little bit more time to make sure that, correct, that decision is correct. It seems that there is a real role for the regulator here because the regulator could make this a lot simpler, which is to say that you've got, you demonstrate the proof of funds, you demonstrate where you're raising those funds from, and until you can do that, the answer is going to be no. And you come to us when you're ready. Inclusions quicker. I, I, I'd imagine that's possibly correct, uh, Damien, in that, in that circumstance. But obviously I can't, I can't imagine what the situation would be like if we had a regulator in this current example that you're raising. And obviously I know a little bit more about it in terms of the background for it all. Um, I can't say too much about it, but I do think there are some benefits to the regulator uh, working in tandem with leagues on this particular topic. Uh, that, that is true. How would you respond if the league, if you were overruled, or more effectively the regulator took a different view to you? I mean, is that, is that something you... As a, as a bit like um, the sort of X factor, you need two green ticks to get in. I mean, that, that is it. I mean, the, the Premier League operating its own test. In the unlikely event, the regulator said yes and we said no, then that then that person couldn't take over that club and vice versa. I'm going to bring Matt in now. Uh, Matt. Thank you, Mr Chair. For um, Rick Parry, um, and this is with regard to a situation where an owner has a, a potential owner, has a track record of being associated with clubs which have, have gone into difficulties overseas. Do you believe that the bill would offer enough powers to uh, allow um, that situation to be prevented in future? I think so. I don't think there's any reason to, to um, be doubtful at this moment in time. And I think that within football, we've been refining the tests that we apply over time. I think a decade ago, um, the tests were probably inadequate and overly simplistic. We've definitely refined them. We take a greater look at people's track records. Um, and I'm not fearful that the, uh, the regulator will not be able to do the same. Thank you. Uh, Brendan. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Jasmine, one of the one of the things that has been raised is about international in, investment, particularly, um, and about creating that level playing field with with other leagues. Uh, do you, do you still have any concerns there, particularly? Because one of the previous uh, witnesses we interviewed suggested that at the moment things are very light touch in terms of what we're doing. Eh? Do you think that is that is still the case? So, uh, Richard, if I could just ask you that first, please. Well, um, <coughs> as you know, the. Um, Professional football exists on the, in a global marketplace, and the Premier League currently, um, by most available metrics, is the most popular in the world. We want that to continue, uh, but it is a competitive marketplace. You couldn't say that 20 years ago, but it is true today, and we'd like it to be true in 20 years' time. Uh, and we have been able to do that um, by collective effort, um, uh, and the clubs continuing to invest in creating a really exciting football competition. And I think the key difference between the Premier League and its other European competitors is the competitive nature of it. We can talk about full stadiums, home and away fans, fantastic uh, brands and history and tradition of the English game. All those things are incredibly important. But the key difference between us and the Germans and the French and the Spanish and the Italians is that you have jeopardy from top to bottom. It goes to the funding of football and the financial mechanics behind it and the key ingredients that go towards that competitive nature and the jeopardy that is in English football at the moment. And we don't want to damage that jeopardy uh, at all. So um, in order for us to be, uh, to be able, really, to better fund the pyramid, we have to be successful. Um, and to be able to be successful, we have to be able to continue to find football-led solutions to the problems that we've got. The regulator's got a very specific role, which is to come in and step in when individual clubs um, have problems, to oversee certain aspects of the game. But I still believe that the football needs to be football-led and the three bodies, or the four bodies, if you include the FA, can do a good job of that in the future, in the same way we've done a good job of it so far. The FA also. Um, we think that in a better regulated environment, where there's more clarity, more certainty, we will get better quality owners. No reason to believe that we wouldn't. Um, there's been a lot of talk about investment, and an investment's a curious word in football. Uh, investment to me tends to mean sensible investment in assets that generate returns. In football it tends to mean excessive spending and then owners then moving on. What we're trying to do <clears throat> in making clubs sustainable is to reduce the dependence on owner funding because we've heard previously owner funding is fabulous until it isn't. We've seen it with Mel Morris, we've seen it with Bolton, we've seen it with Reading. Owners come in, have high ambitions either get fed up, run out of money, become ill, and then the clubs fall off a cliff. If we have a better system of redistribution, making clubs solvent, then we're not dependent on that um, ownership culture. Thank you. And, and Mark, the, um, the regulator, as it is at the moment, only covers the, the top five tiers, so obviously it's going to cover the National League, but not National League North or South or, or below that. I mean, do, you, do you think that's the right way forward? Do you think it should be wider, or do you think it should actually be narrower? We're in a fortunate position from a National League perspective. Um, we run a licensing programme. Part of our um, ethos anyway, without the regulator, is to prepare our clubs, whether they come from Step 2, National League North and South, into Step 1, National Division, and that they're properly prepared to go into the EFL. So that, and you look at the history of our clubs that have been promoted into the EFL, um, the vast majority of them have succeeded and continue to go. You've only got to look this year, look at Wrexham and the story of Wrexham and and everything else uh, that touches on your issue about foreign investment. Of course, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, our challenge is to make sure that clubs who come up from step two are suitably prepared through our licensing programme to step into an issue of being regulated. Equally, the, the issue for us is when somebody falls out of step one um, who are being regulated and sometimes because of they've, got, they've got challenges that they continue to get the support that the regulator may have given, it's incumbent on us to make sure that as they go into step two, it's still our competition, that they get the same checks and balances as they're in there as well to try and turn whatever issues there are around and give them a chance to grow again. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. First of all, to record, we thank Richard for your uh, support of our strategy chatting, uh, being fantastic with it. And also, Richard, I'd like to put on record... My thanks to you for accepting the 13,000 signatures we gave you in 2001, I think it was, to stop Liverpool from moving from Anfield to speak, which would have been a disaster to our heritage, and that was without the independent football regulator. So, well done. 
My question's about financial sustainability, profit and sustainability uh, rules and the lack of authority within the, the scope of the independent football regulator. Now, I think all supporters want a predictable, transparent, principled, proportionate, fair and timely system. Richard, from a Premier League perspective, I think if you speak to uh, supporters of clubs, uh, the Everton Forest, uh, they don't feel as though they've had that. Uh, and there's been lots of confusion uh, around the whole process and how it's been meted out. And also, what's happened with Manchester City as well. 115 charges, nothing uh, as yet. So, why would we not want to protect the integrity of the process and the integrity of the Premier League and indeed the EFL when it comes to that? Why would we not want to give that to the independent football regulator, the ability to met out that punishment in a fair and transparent manner? Well, I don't think... Cases are still pending. Could I ask members to be careful about naming individual clubs, which may uh, uh, be sub judice? OK. Sorry, continue. No, Chair. Well, <laughs> th thankfully, the cases you've referenced uh, have, 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 have concluded now, um, uh, before the end of the season, which at least adds some certainty. We know it's been, it has been a difficult period, um, because this season is the first time that the PSL rules have been activated, shall we call it, in the Premier League, and it's a difficult experience. Uh, and Rick uh, has more experience of that, and it's a, a difficult situation for fans of those clubs to to uh, to live with. Um, but if you have financial rules, you have to enforce them. Um, and I think most people accept that when when taking uh, when taking a step back. The question is: the system, does the system work? The system transparent? No. The question you're asking is: shouldn't the regulator look after all of this? Uh, and I think the decision the regulator the government has taken, which is the correct one is that these, this is for football bodies to look after and, uh, and they're essentially getting involved in the running of the sport and the sporting competitive issues that exist within the game. Uh, so I wouldn't support it, uh, Ian, uh, that, the, that the regulator should look after these rules. Nor the, the regulator has a clear remit to look at the sustainability of football clubs. Teams owned by the Premier League this season with regards to them clubs. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a different topic. and I'm very happy to have a longer conversation with you about it, but I, uh, I do. The scope of the regulator, if would you... Concur with Richards? I, I would actually, yes. Um, you believe because it be down the, to the league? It's, I think it's the boundary of where football authorities deal with the rules that govern the competition. And as Richard has said earlier, part of the part of the role of the PSR rules is competitive balance rather than the um, sustainability of individual clubs. There is an element of crossover, but I do think that PSR squad cost control rules, whenever it replaces PSR should fall firmly with the leagues to operate. So we do agree on that. Okay. Can I add to that as well? Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Because um, I do think it's important. We've got our own financial regulation. Um, if there are gaps in the financial regulation, then challenge the league. Tell us where you think those gaps are for us to change those. Uh, I would argue, as I said earlier, the history of um, clubs at our level, the, our financial regulation works. Um, and as Richard said, it's... It's only as good as ensuring that those regulations are applied. Um, we've applied them, and, and there's two things about applying the regulations. It, it's not just about sanction, it's about helping the clubs to make sure that they don't fall off the edge. And there's been a few high-profile cases in the National League where we've actually been able to survive, save some of those clubs and make sure that they don't go to the wall. Well, I'm not going to name them, but you, you know who, who, who they are. Um, and we've been able to assist those clubs to make sure they do survive. And coming back to what the Minister said earlier about passing some of the issues over to the leagues. This is one example where we should have total um, autonomy to do our thing and for the regulator to step in if we're not doing it. It's got to be made sure to look at those Absolutely. And there's got to be uh, confidence in the integrity of the process. We're going to have to move on. Okay. Uh, Robin Miller. Chairman, um, the, the difference between the three leagues is really quite striking to me, both the levels of investment, the, the, the scale and the nature of the operations that individual clubs run, but also actually in the way that they fail. And in the last session, we heard two quite contrast, contrasting pictures of what the regulator is. Uh, Dr. Philip, who talked about a very light touch uh, regulator in the bill, but Mr. Maguire seemed to talk about something much more interventionist, um, uh, monitoring things, intervening when uh, problems might be about to occur and develop. I'm just curious, then, it's the same question for each of you, how you see that balance playing out and how important that is 
for each of your different leagues. Perhaps, Mr. Masters, I could start with you, please. Well, I think I'm, I'm probably going to start repeating myself. I mean, I, I, I do think that um, light touch proportion regulation can work. Uh, and when uh, the, the committee is scrutinising the bill, it should, try and, it should try and ensure that that's the case, it's the powers of the regulator, um, to intervene at the right moment. And, of course, one of the things that we have argued for... Then, my point is really, do you see it about it's about that the regulator is there to control bad actors... Or do you think it's there to intervene when they see that somebody's about to make a mistake? Well, I think they're both the same thing, actually. So, so what I don't think they should have put in place is broad, <coughs> broad protective measures to ensure that nobody can ever hurt themselves. What I do think is, is, is that um, the, the regulator intends to be preventative and we would be supportive of preventative regulation to stop bad things happening. And when bad things are happening, the regulator has the power. I think those three things are quite subtly different, quite nuanced. That's where I think hopefully the, the, the bill can, can reflect that and does, as I said, come back to the personality of the regulator itself who hasn't been formed yet and hasn't been, key appointments haven't been made. Um, so if the bill is structured in a particular way and the personality of the regulator is to enforce on a proportionate and light touch basis, then I think that can be made to work and will help football. Mr Parry. I'd like to perhaps broaden the conversation a little and touch on the regulator's systemic responsibilities, which we think are really important. The, the purpose of the FL, which we defined four years ago, is to make clubs sustainable. Um, and as I said earlier, that really means reducing the dependence on owner funding. But to do it, you need redistribution to make them solvent and better regulation to make sure they're not profligate. The, the two must go hand in hand. Um, we think that the bill goes a long way, a very long way, towards addressing the, the regulatory aspect properly. What it doesn't do properly is to address redistribution. It's ducked the key issues on that. The danger is if we have um, it being completely effective on regulation but ineffective on redistribution, it'll just be failing to licence clubs and we'll have many EFL clubs not being licensed and going out of business, which cannot possibly be the objective of the regulator. One question, because uh, as you say, um, the differences between the three competitions are striking. Uh, and the question, if I understood you correctly, was that there are failings in all three. If we're talking about financial sustainability, I, I'm at a loss to see where, from a National League perspective, that failing has been, for the reasons that I outlined before. Um, I, I, it's one of the reasons why I um, support a lighter touch position from the regulator but to ensure that there's a safety net there for the sport, for you to step in when there is a need to do so. Um, as I say, the record from a National League perspective has been quite strong, and there was a misunderstanding um, when the fan-led review first kicked off as to what those financial regulations are within the National League, and it wasn't until either, the, I think, the second meeting we had with the fan-led review where that was explained um, that people then understood and realised what the steps are that are being taken by, by the National League. Um, so that, that's the background as to why we think there's a lighter touch. Hi, Matt. Uh, yes, um, I want to particularly look at uh, Clause 55-2B, which you're probably all very familiar with. Um, could I ask for your view on that clause, um, the removal of the ability to look at parachute payments from the regulator's backstop powers? I could ask, did you lobby ministers to include that clause? Yeah, look, we don't think the parachute should be should be part of the backstop power. Have they included? Yeah, that's well. If you if you when when asked for our opinion, did we express it? Yes, we did. Uh, and our, I'm very happy to repeat it here, Clyde. Um, the backstop power is a very novel power, uh, and it should remain so. Uh, it should incentivise football-led solutions, which I believe it intends to do. It drives mediation and negotiation. At the very end, if uh, the people on this table can't come to agreement, it is able to impose a solution in one specific area, which is solidarity. The funding of uh, the rest of the pyramid, normally from the Premier League down, uh, obviously, uh, and any party has the ability to, to trigger that mechanism once every five years. Uh, and all of that has been discussed with all of the people at this top table uh, a, a, along the way. And it's right that it was, and it's right that everyone had their opportunity to express their views. Solidarity 
Par- parachute payments are part of the football pyramid and have been since uh, for, for over 30 <coughs> years, not just between the Premier League and the EFL, but intra-EFL and from the EFL into the National League as well, where there is a generous parachute system for clubs coming in and out of the National League and into the League 2 or the EFL. Solidarity is relatively new. It came around in 2007 when uh, Lord Winnie, once of this parish, agreed a small deal with Richard Sneedmore, then Chief Executive of the Premier League. Today, uh, we have agreed over the past uh, many years a number of different arrangements, and the current arrangement is still in existence. There is no cliff edge. It was agreed in 2019. Um, and at the moment, the amount of, amount of solidarity which comes out of the Premier League to the FL is around about £130 million a year. Um, that is the part that we think should be, uh, should be adjudicated on if there is to be a backstop power, not parachutes. Why not parachutes? Uh, because parachutes are a competitive balance tool that obviously have an impact on, on sustainability as well, as all financial regulations do. And without parachute payments, the Premier League would not be competitive at the bottom end. Um, and you'll hear from clubs this afternoon who'll be able to talk about parachutes from their own perspective. Uh, one of them is Brighton, who came up without a parachute. If you want to be competitive in the Premier League, which is a brutal meritocracy, which is why people love it, um, then you have to be financially supported. Um, And that is the principal purpose of it. If you want the Premier League to be competitive and to be the economic powerhouse that it is and to continue to redistribute its success, then we have to uh, have have parachute payments. And I don't believe they should form part of this regulatory regime. That'd be a balance if you... (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, first of all, we think that the way the clause is drafted is um, intellectually incoherent because it says that parachutes can't be included in uh, revenues, in the definition of revenue. They're not revenue, they're distribution. And to take Richard's point that they should be used separately from solidarity, it is interesting that solidarity payments to championship clubs are literally pegged to parachute payments. They are defined as being 11% of a parachute payment so that they are intertwined In terms of the practical effect of what the clause says, if we look at 2021 figures, five parachute clubs received £233 million between them. 19 championship clubs received £79 million in solidarity. So what we're saying is we can apply the backstop and all its might to the £79 million, but we can't touch the £233. That seems to be the ultimate definition of fiddling while Rome burns, why you can view one without the other I I just don't even begin to understand in terms of the effect of parachutes, just in case people aren't across it if we go back to um, 2010-11, which isn't that long ago, they totaled £30 million they represented 7% of the aggregate turnover of all championship clubs by 2020-21 they'd risen to £233 million 39% of the aggregate turnover of the championship clubs. They have become the cuckoo in the championship nest. They are enormous. So to say you exclude them from the backstop, you might as well not bother with the backstop, frankly. Right. Could I just come back? I mean, we we had a very detailed submission from the EFL explaining your understanding of the current distribution of media money within the two uh, EFL and the Premier League uh, and what the challenges were. I don't think we've had anything similar from the Premier League, have we? You haven't given us your understanding of the current position and what you'd like to see it change to, if you want to see any change. Sorry. Right. The EFL has given us their understanding of the current distribution of funding within the Premier League in the EFL, particularly around <laughs> media funding, and what sort of changes they'd like to see. I don't think we've had a submission from the Premier League identifying what your, your understanding of the position is and what changes, if any, you'd like to see. Well, we have a current agreement, and it was agreed in 2019. So you don't see any no, no, I mean, it's a perfectly legitimate debate to be had. Is, is the funding of football correct? Uh, and that should be reviewed on a periodic basis. Uh, what we have is a, an agreement which stretches out when the future and either party can terminate up to three years. The regulator, this... The current agreement is about to become five years old. So the regu- once the state of the football <coughs> report is done, then the regulator will then turn its mind to, to other issues. So um, um, we're very happy to express our views on the distributions within, within football. Um, we're not shy of doing that. What's the kind of tracing? 
Thank you, uh, Chair. Actually, I have two questions, but let me just continue um, in relation to part six. Um, you'll appreciate, panel appreciate that the UK has nuclear weapons and that there is coding for what happens in the event of a catastrophic diplomatic failure um, and all that coding is well thought through. But the outcome's never 100% certain uh, and he who pulls the trigger isn't always going to be the winner. And so for the committee's sake, can you confirm that you appreciate that part six of this bill is the nuclear equivalent for football? And that can you also confirm that you appreciate that really it should never be triggered, that the only way that it will be triggered is if it continues, if there continues to be a catastrophic failure between the parties sat in the panel in front of us to come to a deal. Can you confirm that you appreciate that that is the situation, that part six has been written to this bill because, frankly, you guys have not come to a deal? Talking about the backstop, okay? With, that's part six. Yeah, yeah I'm aware. I think I think Mark actually, it's really it, no no disrespect. It, we, I will come to you for your views, but I think it's between at the moment. I'd like to hear what Richard and Rick I'm not say in terms of their. Yeah, I'll you. let you come I, in. Don't I, I hadn't uh, I hadn't likened it to nuclear Armageddon, uh, but um, it is an important issue, uh, and we have made attempts to come to a new deal, um, but it hasn't worked yet. I do, as I've said repeatedly. Football solutions are the are the are the right way forward and the best solutions, and I don't wish to be in a situation where the backstop <coughs> power is being activated by any party, and so I agree with you in that respect. Rick, uh, we take a rather different view, in as much as we don't see it as being Armageddon or catastrophic. I mean, football has manifestly failed, uh, and it will because. The market forces are such that it's not, a, it's not an equal negotiation. Um, we have very little negotiating power. We can't, we can't threaten to leave and attach ourselves to the Bundesliga or La Liga. Um, so we're, we're basically stuck. Um, and we think that if the regulator has clearly defined objectives in terms of uh, systemic sustainability, then as the final ed review said, as the 12 month on report said, as the white paper said, and as the government response said, it is the regulator that should have targeted powers of intervention. Intervention implies doing something positive. At the moment, the regulator isn't actually allowed to do anything at all um, because it's reliant on the two leagues, the body that it's regulating, to actually step in. So we believe the regulator should have the powers on the basis that the fan led review, which we think is an enormously important and extremely helpful piece of work, an independent, objective, transparent study, never been done. It may, well, it will have a view on parachutes, and it may well, and we're, by the way, not saying there should be no parachutes. It's the level and the ability to fix them independently. Um, we believe that to make the bill work, it is the regulator, in the event that the final ed review highlights problems, the regulator should be able to institute the process. And we don't think it's Armageddon. We don't think it's nuclear. We think it's logical. It's a game of Russian roulette, though, Greg. Sorry? Is it a game of Russian roulette? Because no, we don't see it that way because the, um, what we see is that the, so much hinges on the final-led review and, as I said, on the objective study. If the EFL were to trigger the backstop, um, and we would hope that we wouldn't, need to or we never would we would actually see that the EFL position would be something very similar to the final ed review because it's the final ed review that will inform the regulator as to whether it's able to meet its strategic objectives it's not for the leads to decide whether the regulator can meet its objectives it's for the regulator to decide so if we were pushing forward a solution I think the likelihood is it would be extremely close to what the final ed review recommended why wouldn't it be so it's not Russian roulette at all. Did you put your head up and then opposite? Well, I just, Mark, Mark, it doesn't speak. But the only thing I would say is that obviously you can you can sort of observe the, the the difference in incentives that now exist because of the regulatory power, the backstop power. This is all, there's a third person in this discussion. That's one of the issues which I I, I would like to highlight to the committee is it does create different incentives because there is a third person that will adjudicate in the end. Uh, and, of course, since 2007, we have been able to come to agreement bilaterally outside of the 
um, the, the gaze to the public eye uh, and doing increasingly uh, uh, generous deals and share our success. And we're happy to continue in that vein. Um, but I, I would like to point that out. There's an additional dimension for me, if I can, as far as the backstop's concerned. And the backstop's really important to our clubs. And when we're at the base of the system, as I said earlier, um, where the gap between the solidarity payments that we get from the Premier League, we only get money from the Premier League, the solidarity payments that we get from the Premier League um, is extremely helpful. But there is a gap between our clubs and the EFL clubs. So for me, um, we could come to an agreement with the Premier League over our next round of solidarity payments. Extremely helpful. And as it looks on the surface, it is really, really good. And we could accept that. Um, but then there could be a deal between the Premier League and the EFL that has an impact of widening that gap. And that's not good for the game because the, the gap is already very wide. I would urge you to look at the difference in the solidarity payments uh, across the game, including ours and where that is. Um, and it would seem a difficult position then for us to be able to activate the back backstop. We hope we never need to do it. Um, but it is a port an important aspect uh, of the game uh, it, to enable us to make sure that that gap doesn't get wider. We know where we are. We know where we sit in the pyramid. Um, and we're proud to sit where we are. But what we can't afford to happen is for that gap to get wider. And I would urge the wording of the... Last Sorry. question to Rachel, because yeah, I think you're repeating yourself. Rachel. Uh, I'll summarise it and for each of you to apply around the State of the Game report. Um, how important is it? Any specific topics you think it should cover? Should it be initially within a certain time frame and subsequently at what sort of intervals? Critically important, and we look forward to playing our part in it. The, the key issue we have uh, is in relation to its uh, regularity. So it should come as quickly as it can, be done properly and efficiently. Uh, but after that, we believe it should not be at three-year intervals, which will lead to almost you know, um, perpetual discussion about the state of football. Uh, and there should be a longer period of time. We're suggesting five years is the appropriate time uh, for the regularity of those reports. Um, Football's had a lot of uncertainty through COVID, through the regulatory interventions that we're now talking about, and I believe that football does better when it has certainty. Our commercial <coughs> deals are becoming longer, so we're doing four-year commercial agreements. I think um, the FLs is five. Um, most of our international revenue is tied up over six-year agreements. If you look at other uh, industries, the Ofcom review is every five years. Um, I think uh, the telecoms industry is 10. Three is incredibly short. It'd be like painting the, the, the fourth bridge. Once you finish one report, uh, you'll have to start another. Um, it's great for the economists uh, and for the consultants, bad for the competition organisers and the clubs. Can we get to Rick and then on to Mark. Rick? So, echo what Richard said in terms of the report being incredibly important. Um, <coughs> important that it's comprehensive, able to address every issue facing the game, including parachute payments. Um, the big point we'd like to make is that we think that three-year interval for the first one to be completed is way too long. We shouldn't think that. It should be a maximum of a year. Uh, we see no reason why it can't be completed within a year. Um, we actually think three years is fine in as much as um, eight of the last Premier League TV deals have been on a three-year cycle. The Champions League TV deal is on a three-year cycle. Parachute payments operate on a three-year cycle. Football operates on a three-year cycle. Um, but the big report is the first one, and we think that the subsequent ones would be fine-tuning. They're not going to be a complete reinvention. And it will be quick. Um, the, for, for me, uh, again, I echo the importance of the report and will address things that the regulator doesn't cover. Uh, and, uh, and on that point, uh, it, it will address things that are important to our game and that the fan-led review spoke about, things that are, not, that are outside the scope and understand why they're outside the scope, three up, three down, protection of players and all of that sort of stuff. It's really important that the emphasis on those isn't lost and we have the ability to deal with it. Um, and the report is, is there to, to highlight the wider issues within the game. OK, thanks. So, order, order. I'm afraid that brings us to the end of the time allotted for the committee to ask questions.